Okay, so this is a video for Unit 12, um, Kinetics. I'm hoping that we can cover most of this um, via uh, this lecture so that when you guys get to class on Tuesday, we can kind of go through some practice and uh, really sort of catch up a little bit. So we've got a bunch of stuff to do in this unit. Um, we're going to look a little bit at kinetics and reaction mechanisms. It is a much more different type of concept that we're going to be handling than what we've been doing. It's all math, basically. And the great thing about this is you get the equations. The hardest thing about dealing with kinetics and mechanisms and reaction rates honestly is determining which one to use in a question. So we're going to look at experimental data and calculate the reaction rate. It is going to be uh, very similar actually to what you do in lab. And then we're going to define rate law, rate constant, rate order, the differential, and the integrated rate laws. And we're going to figure out what type of rate law to use and we're also going to calculate the order of a rate law or the order of a reaction. Now, this is actually a little um, wrong. I no longer ask you to know uh, which is the rate law for first, zero first or second order reactions. Instead, it's more be able to incorporate the right rate law to the right experimental data. You'll be able to use the integrated rate law to calculate either time or concentration, depending on which variables you get. We'll look at half-life and um, uh, really catalysts. We'll briefly cover elementary steps in a reaction mechanism, but I think because of time constraints with three days of snow, um, I'm going to leave this objective off of the exam, um, but the rest will still be there. So we're going to start by looking at reaction rates and then we'll get into rate laws. And then from there we'll go into kinetics and um, catalysts. Now, we know that a chemical reaction is uh, going to be uh, reactants reacting to produce products, okay? Now, with that in mind, we can talk about the rate of a reaction in terms of what is happening to um, the reactants or to the products. So it's going to be the change in reactant or product um, over the change in time. Now, if it is the rate of a reactant, it's going to be a negative. It's going to, the concentration is going to go down. Um, and so the rate is going to be equal to a negative delta A over T, delta T. Um, if it's for a product, it's going to be positive because that is going to be forming. Um, delta A, there we go, over delta T. And so, for example, you can kind of consider if we had nitrogen dioxide, NO2 decomposing to nitrogen monoxide and O2 gas. Balance this equation. Here is our overall reaction. We can talk about the reaction rate by first evaluating the concentration. In the beginning, you have all reactant and absolutely no product. That is exactly, oh look, there's the reaction. Um, that is exactly what you're going to be looking at next week in lab. You're going to be using a very similar type of situation. You start off with all reactant, none of your products. Over time, you get a formation of your products as those reactants disappear. So as this goes down, this goes up, and this goes up. More importantly, because of the mole-to-mole -mole ratio, 2 to 2. This right here is a 1 to 1 ratio. Um, whatever you lose is what you gain. On the other hand, the 
nitrogen dioxide to oxygen gas is a um, 2 to 1 ratio. So however much you lose, you gain half because of this 2 to 1 ratio. You can again kind of think of it in terms of the product starts, uh, the reactant starts very high as you go through the reaction, you lose that concentration, the, you gain product concentration. Now, you can kind of see that these are curved lines, and it's because as you decrease concentration, it is not a linear relationship as to how often uh, reactant molecules or product molecules will be able to collide with the right energy. And so what we really do is to find the energy or to find the rate of a reaction at any given time, you take the tangent to this curve and look at it that way. Um, in fact, I took a whole class on um, the instantaneous rate of a reaction, um, but that's a whole different story. So the instantaneous rate is going to give you the rate at that particular time. Um, it's basically just the slope of the tangent to the curve. Okay. Now, um, it is informative, um, but it's also um, mathematical, right? Probably the more... Uh, common way that we deal with this is by looking at the rate law. So the rate law shows how the rate of the reaction depends on the concentration of the reactants. So for example here we have one reactant, it's nitrogen dioxide. So the rate is going to be equal to some rate constant which is particular to um, that situation multiplied by the concentration and molarity of the reactant raised to some um, exponent. Now, the exponent itself is not uh, going to come from the balanced chemical equation. It instead has to do with how the molecules collide, okay? Um, you want to it relates the how important this molarity is to the overall rate. Is it does it matter at all, um, or does it have a big impact? So the rate law here, the rate is equal to K times the molarity of nitrogen dioxide to the nth power. The concentrations. Um, of the products don't appear because it's all based on how often the reactants are going to collide under the right conditions with the right energy and the right orientation to make a product. And so the only thing that matters is the reactant. Now we actually call the value of the exponent um, the order of reaction. Um, or the sum of the exponents would be the order of reaction. So because there's only one reactant here, this is going to be the order of reaction. Um, you cannot find this from the balanced equation. I know I just said that. I cannot stress it enough. This is completely different from the next unit, and I want to make sure you have this. This can, exponent value can only be found from experimental data. Now, technically, there's two types of rate laws. The first is a differential rate law, which shows how um, the rate of a reaction depends on concentrations of your reactants. And then the integrated rate law shows how the concentration of species um, also depends on time. And so this will have a much more um, informative issue in terms of the time uh, component. Now, generally for this unit, and again, that changes in the next unit, 
we're going to consider reactions that only go forward. There's no reverse reactions. Once you make a product, it's not going to decompose back to a reactant. Um, so for us, our reaction proceeds in one direction. Now, in addition, we are going to be able to say that um, because we know the differential and integrated rate laws um, are going to be established, we can use experimental data to really go ahead and confirm the exponent values and gain a lot of information. So in terms of what we are going to um, use these for, generally uh, it depends on the data that you have, and we're about to do some examples in a few minutes, um, but a lot of it has to do with what is convenient and more importantly what is cheap. Um, and so we're going to look at uh, which one you can calculate or which one is easier to calculate depending on what lab you're in and so on. Now, in general, if you really understand rate laws, you can begin to use the rate law to give us information about the individual or the elementary steps involved in a reaction, okay? Um, we are going to probably skip this on the exam, um, but I'm still going to talk about it a little bit. So we can determine experimentally the power or the order of reaction, okay? Now the way that we do that is we are going to control the concentration of all of the reactants. And it allows us to see uh, what impact the different reactants are going to have. Um, let me see, do I have an example? Okay, I don't see an example at the moment. But let me, um, let's go ahead and do it this way. So you're going to get a table of data, um, something like concentration of your reactant um, and rate. Here we only have uh, one reactant, so we would only watch it with one. And so you could see, okay, and because I'm making this data up, I'm going to be very kind to myself, 0 0.1, maybe the rate is something like 2. If I were to double this with all other conditions being Id identical, we can see the impact of on the rate. Now, if it was a zero order reaction, meaning that the rate is equal to K times the concentration of NO2 raised to the zero power, then what that means is it doesn't matter what impact you have uh, or what change you have for the concentration, the rate is going to be the same. This concentration to the zero has, um, it's going to make this a one. And basically one times K, the rate is always going to be equal to your K or your constant. Now on the other hand, come on, there we go. If it ends up being that it's a first order rate reaction, here the rate is equal to the constant times the concentration of NO2 raised to the one power. For that type of data, what you would see is if you were to double the concentration, you would double the rate. And then finally, if you had a second order rate reaction, the rate is equal to NO2 times or raised to the second power. Here, if you were to double it, oops, um, I'm going to write it over here. 
because it's a raise to the second, what you're going to have instead is not just doubling, but um, quadrupling. So here your rate would be an 8. 2 to the, um, oh, there we go. Now, in general, um, there's a bunch of these determine the order of reaction problems in your sample questions. And to be entirely honest, I'm rewriting your sample questions um, right now so that instead of having 60 or so, there'll be probably, um, based off what I'm looking, it's looking like right now, it's probably going to be about 25 to more likely 32. Um, I'm hoping that the fewer sample questions will mean that you guys will actually go through your homework a little bit better and um, see if that's able to help. Maybe you guys won't be overwhelmed. Now, in terms of the method of an initial rate, the value of initial rate is going to be determined as close to the zero time spot as possible. And this is going to be really limited based on your equipment, um, the overall how quickly things happen, the monitors, and all of that other stuff. Now with that in mind, you're going to use different initial concentrations, and you're going to calculate the initial rate for each. And then you're going to get a table of data, very similar to the one I just wrote out, and you're going to use that to see um, the order of the reaction with respect to each reactant. So for example, if you had more than one react, reactant, such as something like a reaction of A plus B goes to C, here we have a reactant here, a reactant here. We would have to write the rate law as the rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of the first reactant raised to a power times the concentration of the second reactant raised to a different power. Now guys, here, these two um, exponents are different numbers. They have no impact on the balanced equation. They also are not necessarily related to each other. They could be the same or they could be different. The only way to determine them is by using experimental data. Now, let me see if I have room. What's going to happen for the experimental data is it's going to look like um, concentration of A, concentration of B, rate, okay? And you're going to be given numbers that look kind of like this. Let me do it like that. Um, maybe I should do... Yeah, we'll leave it like this for a minute. Okay. And so what you want to do to find the order or of the reaction with respect to A, um, you're going to look for a situation where you double the concentration of A from 0 0.1 to 0.2 or whatever values you have while you maintain everything else the same. So like the concentration of B, we want to be the same so that we know any difference in the rate is only reflected based on um, the change with A. So here, we double the concentration of A while B stays the same. So we know that there's no impact on rate from B. Any change in rate has to do with A. So A, the, if we double A, the rate from um, <laughs> goes from 2 to 4. <coughs> and so the rate doubles. This doubles, this doubles. It is a matter of um, the same thing happening. So it's going to be a first order reaction with respect to A. If we look 
at the reaction with respect to B. We want it to double for B while being the same for A. Here A stays the same while this doubles. So any impact on rate is not going to be because of anything for A. It's going to be depend solely on B. And so you can kind of come over here and see, OK, we doubled this. There's no impact here on the rate. So the M is probably going to be a 0. Or it will be a 0. There's no impact. So overall, 1 plus 0, the rate is going to be a first order reaction overall. And you could even simplify this because it's 1 and 0. We could write it as A is equal to the concentration of A. You can write the 1, but mathematically it's unnecessary. This raised to the 0 makes it a 1. So again, you don't have to write that. So we could simplify this as rate is equal to K times the concentration of A. All right, so how do the exponents or the order of, of reaction with respect to each reactant compare to the coefficients in the balanced equation? Go ahead and pause it here and kind of try to think through it a little bit because I would really like you to have a thought process before I talk about it. Um, the answer is in the notes of the slides, but I still want to have you think through it. Um, okay, so remember that the order has to be determined experimentally. There's no relationship whatsoever to the coefficients in the balanced equation. Um, while the reaction itself gives us what reacts and what's produced, it does not tell us the mechanism. And so it can't tell us how important it is going to be for the overall rate. OK. Now, we just did an example where we had a first order uh, rate law. The rate of a first order rate law is going to be the rate is equal to the constant times the concentration of a reactant. Integrated is going to be the natural log of concentration of A is equal to negative kt plus the natural log of concentration A at time 0. And um, guys, y equals mx plus b. Here, your y, the natural log, oops, that is not an L. Natural log of A is going to be equal to the rate um, times the time. Uh, usually something like this, um, where your K has to be a negative value because you're decreasing your, your reactant concentration over time, with your uh, Y-intercept being the concentration of, or the natural log of the concentration of A at time zero. So again, here is a graph that um, would resemble that of a first order rate law. Um, it is a linear graph, this relationship for natural log of concentration times time. This is the only linear relationship for a first order reaction. It differs for zero order, it differs for second order. Um, and so it kind of is important that you know this is the rate law for the first order reaction. This is the integrated. Um, and guys, these are on those... Um, equation worksheet or equation sheets I give you. Now, in terms of a first order reaction, what is going to happen is you can also calculate the amount of time it takes for the reactant to reach half of its original concentration and that's called its half-life. For a first order reaction, the half-life is equal to 0 0.693 over the rate constant. Notice, guys, it does not depend on the concentration. There's no A involved here. And so it is just a straight um, number. With that in mind, um, 
really keep this in mind for next week's um, lab. It'll help you out if you can um, not only take your equation sheet, but also just um, keep in mind that it's a constant here. Okay. Now, let's just take a minute to uh, look at a, a sample problem. A first order re reaction is 35% complete. It's 35% complete, 0 0.35 out of 1, which means that 0 0.65 is left. Okay? This is the amount of A that is left at this given period of time. And that is at time 55 minutes. What is the value of K? Well, we can scroll back and you can get, oops, there we go, um, a couple of things here, okay? Um, the best example here is to use the integrated rate law. So we're going to come forward and we're going to use, oops, another one, there we go, the natural log of A is equal to negative KT um, plus the natural log of A at time zero. We know originally we had 100% or 1, so we have this value, we have our time, and we have the concentration of A when we're talking about it right now. So the natural log of A, oops, I didn't actually write my number in, the natural log of the concentration 0 0.65 is equal to negative K times 55 minutes plus the natural log of the initial A concentration, which is just 1. Now, it depends on how comfortable you are with your math. Um, you could just go ahead and plug in your numbers now um, if you prefer before you do anything. Um, that would give us the natural log of 0.65 is negative 0.431 equals negative k times 55 plus 0, which goes away. Um, in order to cancel, we can divide both sides by um, well, we could do it by 55 and then negative 1. I'm just going to do it all at one time and say negative 55. This is going to cancel. This is going to cancel. It leaves us with k is equal to negative 0 0.431 divided by ne negative, oh no, go away, negative 55, which is going to give us something like 7.8 times 10 to the negative 3. Okay? Um, generally, I'm not going to give you percents as concentration. I'm probably just going to plug it in as molarity. Um, but this is the example I wrote um, or we ha I've been using. Um, so just keep in mind, um, to me, this is a harder example because you actually have to derive the A concentration. Um, but usually I'm going to give you molarity already. So that kind of wraps up the first order. Oh, goodness gracious. There we go. Um, the first order rate laws. For second order, it means that you have an overall reaction or exponent sum of two. So if you have a situation where you only have one reactant, it's going to be the rate is equal to K times the concentration of A squared. And the integrated rate law, which is going to give you that linear relationship, is equal to y equals mx plus b. Here, the 1 over the concentration of a is your y. Your slope is still your k. t is your x. And this is your y-intercept. It is a different uh, linear relationship. So here you can see that the 
relationship that would have been linear for um, a first order reaction is now curved and this relationship the one over the concentration um, versus time is the linear relationship. The second order half-life equation gives the half-life is equal to 1 over K times the initial concentration of A. Here there is a relationship between the concentration of A. There's also um, the K involved. Now what this means is for these reactions the half-life is going to get longer the more dilute the reactants are. As the reaction proceeds, it's going to take longer and longer for the reactants to collide with the sufficient energy and orientation. So it's going to continually <coughs> it's going to continually change. Generally, what happens is each successive half-life is going to double because as you um, half the concentration of this, 1 over 0.5 gives you overall 2. Um, where does there it is? For reaction where you have A going to products, where you have the initial concentration of 5 molar and the first two half-lives are 25 and 50 minutes respectively, write the rate law for the reaction. Here we see that a first order rate, um, excuse me, let me start that over. The half-life for a first order reaction would have the same half-life no matter how far along you are. Because these change, it must be a second order rate law. And so that's going to give us that the rate is equal to K times the concentration of A raised to the second power. And we know this too because experimental data shows us that the half-life is increasing. Now, because we know um, that it is a second order rate law, we can also use the um, honestly, there, I think there's two ways we can calculate it. Let's go ahead and use this equation here, okay? Um, the half-life or the T1 half is equal to 1 over the initial concentration of A and over K equals 1 over K times the initial concentration of A. That's going to tell us that we have 25 minutes is equal to 1 over K times 5.0. Depending on how you learned math, you can cross multiply or you can just multiply both sides by K and 5 or 5K. That's going to give us 5 times K times 25 equals 1. Um, to get K by itself, we're going to divide both sides by 125. So K is equal to 1 over 125, which in our calculator is ah, fat finger syndrome. There we go. Um, 0.008 um, minutes to the minus 1, or we could say 8 times 10 to the minus 3 minutes to the minus 1. Now, we can also calculate A at any given time using the integrated uh, rate law. So here we know that 1 over A, oops, there we go is equal to um, K and I mean you can always go back if you're not completely positive remember you're going to be given this equation and all of them on the exam it's going to 
oops, wrong slide. It's going to be equal to kT um, plus 1 over the initial concentration of A. And so to plug it in, uh, guys, I'm going to come up here. I don't know how else to, to fit it all in. Um, that's going to give us 1 over A is equal to K, which is 8 times 10 to the minus 3, times 525 minutes, plus 1 over 5 molar. Okay. Now if we plug all this in, 1 over A is going to be equal to Uh, 4.4. So we can take the reciprocal of both sides or cross multiply depending on how you want to do it. Um, 1 over 4.4 is going to give us something like 0 0.23. Um, and because we're looking at the concentration, our units are going to be molarity. This is a very good sample question, guys. Um, I'll give you some kind of experimental data, whether it's the table I drew a few minutes ago or information about the half-life, and then I could ask you to do any number of these things. For a zero-order rate law, um, because the exponents are going to be zero, the rate is going to be equal to the rate constant. The integrated rate law, the um, linear relationship is y is equal to negative, I'm sorry, y is equal to mx plus b. Here your slope is the negative k, your x is t, your y is concentration, um, and so it's just a straight concentration versus time graph that is going to be linear here. And notice your slope is a negative k. The half-life for a zero-order reaction is basically the, um, the initial concentration of A over 2 times the rate constant. Here, um, the half-life is going to get shorter the more the reaction progresses because the reactants are decreasing, and that's a factor on the top. So how can you tell the difference among zero, first, and second order rate laws? Go ahead and pause for a minute and think through this. Um, and then come back to it when you're ready. For th this, um, for the zero order reaction, the linear graph, can I fit that here, is going to be the concentration versus time. For the first order reaction, it's going to be the natural log of the concentration versus time. And for the second order reaction, it's going to be 1 over the concentration versus time. Um, in addition, uh, the half-life uh, is going to get longer for... I meant to start over here. It's going to become longer for a second order reaction, um, not be dependent or no change on a first, and it's going to become um, shorter on a zero order reaction. Now, you could write the half law equations if you want to, um, but guys, keep in mind that this is... Um, Oops, 693. Is it 693? 693, yeah. Over K. But because these are given, it's not necessarily as um, imperative that you have these memorized, okay? Um, so with that in mind, 
the half-life for a second order reaction is going to be equal to 1 over K times the initial concentration. The half-life for a zero order reaction is going to be equal to um, the initial concentration of A over 2K. And we could talk about the slopes for each of these as well, but there's a slide later that works really well. Now, <sighs> automatic updates. Okay, so if you want to, um, I'll see what I can do to make this work later. Here is the slide that I would use. You don't even have to use it as a flashcard slide, but when you're working sample questions, kind of go through it and use it to answer questions so that you can very quickly find the equation that you want. Okay, so consider the reaction here where we have an initial time of uh, five, excuse me, I am so sorry, the initial concentration of five molar, a K of one times 10 to the minus two, and um, we want to calculate A after 30 seconds have passed. And we can do that assuming we have an order of reaction that is given, okay? So for A, if we have a zero order reaction, we know that A is going to be equal to KT or minus KT, sorry, plus the A0. And so we can plug in and say that our concentration is equal to negative 1 times 10 to the minus 2 times 30 seconds, 30.0 I guess, um, plus the initial concentration of 5.0 molar. And if we plug that in, you should get something like 4.7 molar. For the first order reaction, here we know that the natural log of A, this is our linear relationship, is going to be equal to negative KT plus the natural log of the initial concentration of A. So we can again just plug it in. We get negative 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 times 30 seconds plus the natural log of 5.0. Now here, when you plug all of this in, you get the natural log of 5.0 plus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 times 30. You get something like 1.9. But remember that this is equal to the natural log of A. So in order to handle that, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take the second natural, to the, natural log or e to the x of that. Actually, I think I forgot my negative. Did I forget my negative? I did. Let's just double check that this math is right. Okay, so I figured out my error. Um, I just hit an extra button. It shouldn't be 1.9 here. It's, uh, it's because I messed myself up. It's going to be 1.3. Um, and that's the natural log of A. So then you take 10 or e to the x of each side and you end up getting 3.7. Okay? Now, that's for a first order reaction. 
For a second order reaction, we're going to use the graph that is linear for it. I'm going to come up here and do it there. And this is going to be 1 over A is equal to negative KT plus 1 over the initial concentration of A. So we're going to get negative 1 times 10 to the minus 2, 0 0.0, times 30, plus 1 over um, 5 molar. And so that's going to give us, make sure this math is right as well, Zero point zero one times thirty. Oh, this should be a positive. That's an equals. Um, so you end up getting um, zero point five, but that's equal to one over A. So when you take the inverse of both sides, A is going to be equal to two. Now here is where um, we can talk a little bit about the reaction mechanism. Now the fact of the matter is um, most chemical reactions are not going to happen in one step. Instead, you have a series of elementary steps that are going to occur where you have an intermediate that is formed. Um, because it is an intermediate and it is immediately going to be used, you don't see it in, as a product and you don't see it in the chemical equation. So a good example of that is something like nitrogen dioxide reacting with carbon monoxide to make nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide. Here you have uh, two nitrogen dioxide molecules reacting to give nitrogen trioxide and nitrogen monoxide. This intermediate comes over and then hands one of the oxygens over to carbon monoxide to make CO2 and nitrogen dioxide. Now, if we were to add these steps up, uh oh, that was an accident. If we were to add these steps up, we have two, one, two. And I'm going to write it over here for. Uh, technology purposes, plus a nitrogen trioxide plus a carbon monoxide. That goes over to form nitrogen monoxide plus nitrogen dioxide plus nitrogen trioxide plus carbon dioxide. Now think back to net ionic equations. We are going to cancel anything that isn't, that is the same on both sides. So we have a nitrogen trioxide here and one here. We don't need them. We have a nitrogen dioxide here, two here, so they cancel. And we're left with nitrogen dioxide plus a carbon monoxide reacting to form nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide. Now, for elementary steps, you could have a unimolecular, bimolecular, or multi, we'll just go with that, molecular step. For a unimolecular step, there's only one molecule that is involved. It's a first order uh, step. Bimolecular involves the collision of two molecules that have to be oriented just right with the right energy. This is a second order step. And termolecular is going to have the collision of three mo molecules 
it's third order and honestly there it's a very rare it almost never happens because it just takes um, too much to get it right now the rate determining step is the step that is going to determine the overall rate it is going to be the slowest step and the step that therefore determines um, what the reaction rate is now the sum of the elementary steps have to give the overall balanced equation for the reaction and the mechanism must agree with the experimental data so for example Oh, for goodness sake. We'll try to do these in the classroom then. We have three steps. Step here, step here, and a step here. If we add these together, we should be able to get the overall reaction up here. And so all I'm doing right now is crossing off things that are the same on both sides. And... nitrogen doesn't work it's because we haven't switched it around yet this is why we are going to skip this um, we are going to deal with this later if we have time so for example here we have a reaction where we want, um, you know what, no, we're going to skip this, it's not on the test anyway. I've already defined it. I think that is sufficient. I do want to talk briefly about um, the collision of those molecules. So guys, while I could ask a question um, concept-wise about what an elementary step is or what the rate determining step is, I'm not going to ask you to determine the rate determining step from experimental data and I'm not going to ask you to manipulate it like Hess's law problems the way that was just set up um, because most reaction mechanisms end up being kind of long it's possible to do it in two minutes but I'd rather keep it to straight kinetic material okay so here we have the collision model here you have molecules that have to collide to react they have to be, um, they have to collide with the right amount of energy at the right temperature or kinetic energy and in the right orientation. So activation energy is the energy it takes to go from reactants to products. So here are my reactants, here are my products. There's usually some hump that I have to overcome to get to this intermediate. And so this is my activation energy. I don't know why these are not working. Now, the larger this activation energy, the less likely that a collision is going to react. It takes a lot more. Um, if a high activation energy is there, it means that the higher um, fraction of molecules probably aren't going to make that and you're not going to get a reaction. The lower the activation energy, like if it was like this, um, those reactions happen much faster, okay? So you have a reaction that happens with the activation energy to form an intermediate. That intermediate then breaks apart to make your products. Now, the collision has to have enough energy to not only produce the reaction, it has to allow the reaction to, um, not only for the reactants to collide, but for the reaction to happen. So it has to be equal or greater than the activation energy. Now it also has to be in the right orientation. Um, so for example, like a lot of biologists love to do the Pac-Man site. And so if you had the right orientation, this Pac-Man would be coming right up to a piece of pizza. If they collide instead, and it's like this, 
it doesn't matter how much these guys collide, they are not going to react because this is not aimed in the right direction. Okay, now the way that we can create, relate um, kinetics is with this, um, we can say that the rate constant is equal to A, which is the frequency factor, times E raised to the negative activation energy over RT, where R <coughs> is a constant and T is the temperature in ke uh, Kelvin. Remember the Kelvin temperature is related to the kinetic energy, whereas Celsius is not. Linearly, we could say that the natural log of K is equal to uh, mx plus b. So our m is negative activation energy over r, x is 1 over t, this is our b, and the natural log of K is our y. And so this is what the graph would look like, the natural log of K versus 1 over the T, where the slope is going to be negative, um, or the, the change in the natural log versus the change in 1 over temperature, or negative EA over R. Okay. So chemists con uh Battery, we're okay. For this rule of thumb, um, every time you increase by 10 degrees Kelvin in temperature, you generally get a double rate of reaction. What is the activation energy for this statement to be true? especially if we go from 25 to 35 degrees um, Celsius. So if we go back here, we can look at um, how this relationship holds, okay? Now, if we come this way, we can talk about uh, the natural log being equal to the activation energy over R, which is um, 8.3145, I think, joules per Kelvin mole. Now, this is going to be related to 1 over the temperature, but we have two different temperatures here. So we need to consider um, the initial, or the T1, and the t 1 over the T2. Oh my goodness. Um, so then, because we know our K, our rate, is going to double, we can, instead of saying natural log of K, we can just put a 2 here. Only problem we have is our T's are not in Kelvin, so we need to add 273 for both of these. Now again, guys, I got to tell you, this is all in that um, equation sheet. So now we have the natural log of 2 is equal to EA over 8.3145 times 1 over 298 minus 1 over 308. And we can solve this for our activation energy. Um, generally, what I would do is I would probably say 1 divided by 298 uh, minus 1 divided by 308 and I would solve this and then divide both sides by that. So the natural log of 2 
divided by this and then multiplied by our activation energy should give you something like 8, no, sorry, 53 kilojoules. Or actually 53,000 joules is what I have. Um, so just watch your units for this. Okay, so a catalyst is something that is going to help increase the speed of a reaction without actually being used up. It's going to give a different pathway or a way of getting to a different intermediate of lower activation energy. And so like an uncatalyzed pathway is going to have high activation energy. Catalyzed pathway is going to have lower activation energy. In general, the number of collisions that um, are going to be effective is going to be much greater in a catalyzed uh, reaction. So here it's something like, I don't know, maybe 30% instead of 10%. Heterogeneous catalysts are things that are in a different um, state of matter. So it's like when you have a gas or a liquid um, reacting with a solid catalyst. Um, you can also have ad adsorption which is when you have a, um, a compound come and being held here. Um, it would be like Miss Pac-Man being hung on a wall, and then she waits until the pizza floats by and she grabs it. I'll try to figure out what's going on with the videos. I don't know why they're doing that. So for a heterogeneous catalyst, you get adsorption and activation of the reactants where they're held just so. You get migration of the absorbed reactants on the surface. Then they will react, and eventually they escape or just become products. Homogeneous catalysts are going to be in the same phase of matter, and usually these are like enzymes. That is essentially it for this unit. Um, when we come into class on Tuesday, we are going to be doing a lot of practice of these types of problems. And then from there, we will um, begin equilibrium on